time is very 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 negligible if it's a normal cut so similarly the best is doing both dawa and isla but if your time is restricted and if two are in front of you but naturally speaking to a non muslim and trying to get him closer to islam removing the shirk in his life and getting him closer to allah so that he enters jannah it will take more priority than doing isla to a muslim getting him closer to islam but the best is doing both but between the two but natural dawa according to me carries more priority it's come on the facebook again by zedin arik he's a non muslim and he says that if a person is cremated then how will he be questioned about the questions asked in the grave as he does not have a grave that's a very good question and many people are confused that because there is a hadith of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam that after you die you will be you will be questioned in your grave and there's also mention of the azab the punishment in the grave and it also says that the people who are buried they'll be questioned you have to understand that what this hadith mean when the prophet said that after you are buried it means that because today we know that most of the human beings in the world they are buried the christians the muslims majority of the human in the world today if you do a survey they are buried less people are cremated some are given to the vultures it's die they are buried and never grieve so based on that when the statement is made it, it is mainly meaning after you die you will be questioned if you are buried it's in the grave if not wherever you are that doesn't mean that if you are not buried you will not be questioned there are chances that you can maybe wild animals may kill you and you don't get buried there are chances you'll drown does it mean you won't be questioned no because for questioning two things are required the soul and the body the body if you realize even when you are buried it gets disintegrated it gets merged into the earth so the main concept is that if allah can resurrect you on the day of judgment why can't he yet whether you have a body or not whether they are buried or whether they have drowned whether they are cremated allah can yet if he wants to give you give you pain want to give you punishment as, as allah says that that in the quran in uh, surah insan chapter number 75 verse number 3 that if those people who think that allah cannot resurrect them on the day of judgment so allah tells them he can not only can allah how can allah reassemble our bones on the day of judgment so allah says tell them that allah can not only reassemble the bones he can reconstruct in perfect order the very tips of your finger talking about fingerprints allah can even get your fingerprints which is not even identical in a million people so when he can resurrect on the day of judgment why can he do in the grave so it is basically telling you that after you die whether you are in the grave whether you are drowned whether you are cremated there will be a minor question and answer session there will be some some punishment there may be some rewards but the final recompense as allah says in surah imran chapter 3 verse 185 is the final recompense is on the day of judgment hope that answers the question himayu there is arshad khan and i say wa alaikum salam to them there is sharir mohammad saleh shaukat bin bashir khalidul islam yatu shahir naseeb mohammad qausar dr zakir i love you i love you too for the sake of allah subhanahu wa taala uh mohammad rakibul hasan hamim riha mohammad naseem khan mashallah shahi saiful we feel every moment in our daily activities mohammad rusel i love you i love you too love to dr zakir naik mohammad ali i love all of you and thank you for your duas we'll take the next question this question came on whatsapp my name is sultan and i'm from dubai my mother has a substantial saving through allowance allowances from her children and occasional gifts is it obligatory for her to give zakat considering it's not her income and only her saving as far as zakat is concerned zakat every adult muslim who has a saving of more than the, any adult even if it's a 
non-adult, the adult who is the guardian should give zakat on behalf. Any Muslim who has a saving of more than the nisab level 85 grams of gold for one lunar year, if he or she keeps it, they have to give zakat irrespective of it is whether from the income, whether it's from the gift, whether it's from the allowance. As long as they keep a saving of more than 85 grams of gold for more than one lunar year, then that individual, male or female, including your mother, she has to give 2.5% of that saving every lunar year in zakat. It's compulsory. The next question from Ausain, Tamil Nadu, India. Assalamu alaikum, sir. This question is from a non Muslim who asked me Is Dr. Zakir Naik preaching Islam for money through online social media, etc.? He quoted me a saying from Dr. Zakir Naik that Islam is free. You don't need money to learn Islam. And he's correct. Then why? promote his video cassettes, DVDs for money, etc. He further said that doctor has left his medical profession which gave him earnings and now he is earning more by preaching free Islam. I, I was quiet and I had no answer for this. I request please forward my message Dr. Zakir and I'm, eager waiting, I'm eagerly waiting for his reply. The basic question is posed by non-Muslim that Dr. Zakir next said Islam is free and we see that he's promoting his videos on the social media, on YouTube, and he's selling his video, he's, he's getting money. So if Islam is free, then how come he's getting money and he's earning more money? He's earning more by preaching Islam than what you're earning before. And I agree with the person 100%. I am earning more sawab, more blessings for the akhirah by preaching Islam than what I was doing earlier as a medical doctor. I agree with him. But as far as acquiring money is concerned, never in my life, alhamdulillah, I have charged for any of my books or my videos or any of my work or any of my services of Islam. All my lectures that I give are free. The books that our trust prints is given distributed free. There are other people who are printing my books and they are selling and selling Islamic books is not haram. I give them permission. You can copy my book, you can print my book, you can sell them, you can give them free, you can make money, I've got no objection. Anyone prints my book and sells it, it's better than printing books which are haram, printing Islamic book, inshallah you'll get sawab. But as far as I'm concerned, I never sell any of my books. If we distribute my books, it is absolutely given free. I don't charge for copyrights also, not to a thing. People are willing to offer large amounts for copyrights of my book. I said no, I cannot give you exclusive copyrights for my books. You want, you can print it, let others also print. Same from PDs, all my social media accounts are absolutely free. Even the PSTV is free. In the social media account, what happens that other people copy my videos and they give ads which I've, I, don't, I don't object. Many people to get more views, they put photographs of actresses. You know, and I've never spoken about that. Research. And then once I see that, Zakir Naik speaks on Padmavati. I said, what is it Padmavati? When I Google, I come to know it's the latest movie that had come. So they are doing this to attract, which I don't agree it is correct. So if they're doing something wrong, they will get the money. But as far as the Sawab is concerned, the millions that are watching will come to me. So none of my activities, Islamic activities ever have I charged for. The only activity that my trust also has ever charged is for the school that also it is not a profit. We have spent crores of rupees, millions of dollars running the school. It's not profit making at all. And neither do I take any, any remuneration from my trust. I don't take any salary. Even when I go for giving lectures, the clause is there in the lecture that I will pay my own etiquette. I will take care of my own hotel accommodation. Only thing you have to arrange for the visa. That's my condition. But if the host forces me and doesn't allow me to pay for the hotel, I cannot afford. But the ticket always I bear. Unless it is from a government. If I'm the official guest of the head of state, I cannot argue too much. If I'm being called by a king and by the president or prime minister of a country, that is the time I don't insist that I pay for my own ticket. But otherwise, always, even the awards that I've got uh, for, the, uh, for the King Faisal Award, I got $200,000, that is 750,000 riyal. And even for the Holy Quran, award from Dubai, a million dirham, 
that is more than 270,000 US dollars. All of that, I donated for Vax. So, but let me tell you, if someone takes salary for Dawa, it is not haram, as long as he does not charge more than his market value. But as far as I'm concerned, I don't take because I want, I want more Sawa. Because I left my profession, and I do not charge for any of my activities. In fact, I spend from my own side. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has blessed me. I spend few hours, I used to spend a few hours in business, maybe a couple of days in a month during holidays. And alhamdulillah, I used to make millions of dollars in a year. And majority of my earnings is to go in charity. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given me more in this world also. Alhamdulillah, if I'd done my medical profession, I wouldn't have earned millions of dollars in here, not at all. I don't think so. But because I'm doing in the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the small businesses I do, it gives me, alhamdulillah, a lot of profit. That is the reason I could send, you know, crores of rupees, millions of dollars back to India. It's my hard earned money. And majority of it, I give to charity. Alhamdulillah. And all the social media platforms, even Peace TV. The Peace TV was started, the company was started from our money, but it was Vakf. If I want to commercialize Peace TV, imagine 200 million people watching. And if I say, let the normal charges for a monthly subscription for a channel, is $5. Even if I charge $2, and out of 200 million, even if 2%, suppose, pay, that is 4 million. Multiply by two dollar, I get eight million dollars a month. Multiply by twelve, close to hundred million dollars. And the cost is just a small portion of that. But what am I going to do with this money? This money cannot buy me Jannah because the moment I start charging, the viewership will come down to one percent. And now twenty-five percent of the viewership are non-Muslims on the Peace TV network. If it comes down to one person and non-Muslim non -Muslim is watching, what will I do with the money? For the money, our beloved Prophet Muhammad said that you offer two rakat, sunnah, before the Fajr Salah, and that is more valuable than the earth and the wealth in it. So if you truly love Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and understand Islam, the money, the value of the sahab, is multiple times more than the money. But if you go for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for the akhirah, Allah says in the Quran, if you strive for akhirah, Allah will give akhirah and the dunya also. And Allah has given me millions of times much more than what I deserve. Hundreds of million times. I don't deserve the fame, I don't deserve the wealth, the earning. And alhamdulillah, summa alhamdulillah, even if I thank a billion times to Allah for what he has given to me, it would not be sufficient. I will not be scratching even the surface. It will not be a drop in the ocean. The other questions? Uh, there's a question asked by Jamal Abdi Nasir. Assalamu alaikum, brother. May Allah bless you. I'm watching from Edmonton, Canada. And this is a question that came on the Facebook just a couple of minutes back. My question is, how can I achieve the khushu in my prayer? I feel my salah lacks enough khushu. And there is a similar question that has been asked earlier on the WhatsApp. I'll inshallah club them together so that we can answer more questions in a shorter time. Mm. Yes, this question was asked on the WhatsApp some time before, maybe a couple of days ago. Abdul Soban from Bangladesh, currently living in USA. My question is, could you kindly suggest us some ways or tips to concentrate better in our prayers and gain taqwa, fear of Allah? A similar question is posed by Muhammad Imran Hussein. Assalamu alaikum, sir. My name is Imran from Chittagong, Bangladesh. When I stand in my prayer, I remember the worldly things and I keep thinking over and over again 
about the moments of talking to my friends how can i increase my attention in prayer a similar question again by zerin khandakar assalamu alaikum sir i am from bangladesh many children and adults ask what should we imagine while praying to allah should should it be the kaaba or should we ask them to imagine space and there are many such questions asking mainly on how should we concentrate on salah and this problem of your mind deviating during salah is common don't think it only happens to you it is very common it even happened amongst the sahabas so this is a common phenomena that your mind de deviates when you pray to allah subhanahu wa taala and when you're doing work of allah when you're doing dawa you know you know the shaitan tries and comes and deviates you more and uh, just to make it a light moment you know once once a imam was praying uh salah the maghrib salah and after the imam put the salah over the mutaddi says that imam you have prayed only two rakat imam says no no i prayed three rakat so one person gets up and says you have prayed only two rakat and i'm confident about it he says ha because in my maghrib salah i calculate the profits of my business now i wasn't able to complete it that means you have not finished all the three rakat anyway this is just a joke just for a light moment so your mind does deviate and though it's a joke it's a reality people do even calculate the profit they even think which business should i deal in should i deal in biscuits or should i deal in cold drinks or should i deal in textile it happens i've given a full lecture on this salah the program towards righteousness salah the programming towards righteousness which is available on the youtube you are most welcome to go and hear the full lecture just in short that when you read your salah i always say that most of the muslims they don't understand arabic as a language so what we should do because we are non arabs our 80% of the muslims they're non arabs so more than 80% of us don't know arabic as a language so i always tell them that at least you should memorize the meaning of those portion of the quran that you recite in the salah you should know the meaning of surah fatiha very well bismillahir rahmanir rahim in the name of allah most gracious most merciful alhamdulillahi rabbil alamin praise be to allah the lord of the worlds ar rahmanir rahim most gracious most merciful and so on and so forth after that you recite the surahs the surahs that you recite you should whether it be surah ikhlas whether it be surah nas surah falaq whatever surah see to it that those surahs that you recite in your salah you should know the meaning very well now when you are reciting the arabic portion in your mind because you don't know the meaning only a small portion of your mind is occupied maybe 5% 95% of your mind is free and most of the muslims you ask them to recite surah fatiha from the middle of the sleep they will be able to do it you know so only a small portion so the remaining is blank that is the reason it keeps on wandering now when you recite in arabic and when you also at the same time translate at the back of your mind recite in arabic at the back of your mind the meaning is being translated now more portion of your mind is occupied less chance to deviate those who know arabic as a language besides reciting also concentrate on the meaning and will deviate less now once you start doing this maybe after few months it becomes mechanical you are reciting in arabic you know the translation so well you can say it in the middle of your night in the middle of your sleep so what then besides even recollecting the meaning also concentrate on the meaning a human being cannot concentrate on two things together you can concentrate 50 50 person for example while driving a car you are concentrating partly and also talking no problem but if you are reading a book you can read a book and even listen to something else but your concentration is divided but if 100 person you want to concentrate on reading the book and the meaning you cannot do 100 person reading the book and understanding the meaning and doing something else no so similarly when you are reading the salah in your salah when you are reciting the quran recollect the meaning concentrate on the meaning the more you concentrate on the meaning less will your mind deviate 
and less chances these evil thoughts will come less chances you will think of something else so that's the reason but to concentrate if you know the meaning if you don't know the meaning how will you concentrate this is the most important factor for concentrating and for getting khushu in salah and you try this it will get you wonders but your concentration level also keeps on differing the more you concentrate the more you will you will get the khushu in salah even for the children tell them the meaning of surah fatiha or surah ikhlas and that time it's not necessary that you have to think of something concentration itself occupies your mind you don't have to see an image i don't see any image yes if you don't have anything then you may have to bring an image like kaaba etc but when you're concentrating on the meaning image is not required and you'll get the real khushu hope that answers the question in brief for more details you can see my talk on salah the programming towards that is this we will there is a there is a message on the youtube just a few minutes back i just got on my mobile mohammed saskib has mentioned md saskib sir i want to convert to islam if you want to convert to islam it's a good thing alhamdulillah it is the best thing you can do in your life you're most welcome there is there is to convert to islam is very easy there are main, mainly two basic requirements for anyone to accept islam number one to believe and bear witness that there is only one almighty god allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who has got no partners he has got no associates and you should worship him him alone and no one else you shouldn't do idol worship etc number two is believe that prophet muhammad peace be upon him is the last and final messenger of almighty god if these two things you accept then you can enter the fold of islam and then you keep on practicing islam following the five pillars that we discussed so i'd like to ask you brother that i hope you want to accept islam out of your free will and i hope that no one is forcing you to accept islam and it's not a must that you have to do it in public but since you requested me i will say it in arabic and you can repeat it i will say it slowly and i hope no one is giving you money to accept islam you are doing it out of free out of your free will and surely one of the reasons that you accepted islam may be one of the reasons i mentioned in the answer to my first question i said in arabic brother and you can repeat it ashhadu allah ilaha الا الله واشهد ان محمدا عبده ورسوله if you have repeated this mashallah you are a muslim and may allah accept and may allah forgive all your past sins may you convert it into good deed and may allah grant you jannatul firdaus i'm not used to giving shahada when i cannot hear back the feedback maybe the reply is coming on on the social media and i pray to allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that may you get more knowledge of the deen and may you practice more of islam and inshallah may we be resurrected together on the day of judgment inshallah again from the youtube salman khurshid i am salman khurshid from kashmir my question is that it is mentioned in surah luqman last verse number 1 can no 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 one can predict what is inside the womb of the pregnant woman but today medical science can how so isn't contradicting with science the question poses there the verse in the quran in surah luqman chapter number 31 the last verse was number 27 that allah says that only the knowledge of the r is only with allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and only allah knows when and when it will rain and what will a person earn and what is in the womb of the mother 
So one of the things that only Allah knows and mentioned in the Quran is what is in the womb of the mother. But unfortunately, some of the translations, especially Urdu translation, they have translated it as only Allah knows what is the sex of the child in the mother's womb, which is not a part of the Quran. It is their own addition. What the Quran says, only Allah knows what is in the womb of the mother. It means only Allah knows whether the child in the mother's womb Will he be a boon for society or will he be a bane for society? Will he go to Jannah or will he go to Jahannam? Will he go to paradise or will he go to hell? Will he be beneficial for the parents or will he not be beneficial? This with all the medical equipments in the world. No doctor can tell you when the child in the mother's womb, will he go to heaven or hell? Will he be beneficial for the ummah or not? Will he be benefit for the mother or not? So this is the real translation that don't, we don't know about what is in the womb of the mother talking about the other thing, not about the sex. That's a mistranslation. So that error goes to the translator, not to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Next question. This question. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum assalam. Vimuch from UAE. I reverted to Islam last year in April. Is it necessary to change name in Islam? Second question. I was blessed with a baby boy last year, but I did not do Akika. Is it mandatory? If yes, what shall I do to do Akika from UAE? I need your advice on this. Uh, as far as as the revert has, is it necessary to change the name? It is not compulsory for a non-Muslim when he accepts Islam to change the name unless the name contains the element of shirk, an element of something which is an associate of, 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 of Almighty God. Like if your name is Ram and many people think Ram is Almighty God. Yeah. So if such elements are there of shirk, then you should change your name. Otherwise, changing your name is not compulsory but if you change it is preferable so that people know you accept Islam give a name which has a good meaning because meaning has a lot of impact on 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 the human being itself but changing is not further regarding the second question that is it mandatory to do akika and you had a boy and you didn't do akika and if you have to do it should you do it now you all have been in UAE there are different opinions as far as whether akika is mandatory or not some of the scholars say it is further but the majority say it is sunnat muqida and I agree that the right ruling is that doing aqiqah is sunnat muqida It's a very important sunnah. This practice of aqiqah, slaughtering a sheep in the name of the newborn, is a common practice even of Yomul Jahiliya before Islam came to the Arab country. And the hadith in which Ashaba says that before in the days of Jahiliya, we used to slaughter a sheep and smear the blood on the forehead of the child. But after we accepted Islam and came closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, now we slaughter a sheep and we clean the head of the newborn baby and we smear the head with saffron. And the Prophet, there are various hadiths in which the Prophet recommended to do aqika. And the Prophet said that if it's a boy, you have to slaughter two sheep of the same kind. And if it's a daughter, then only one sheep. So if it's a boy, if it's a son, two sheep of the same kind. If it's a daughter, if it's a female, then only one. And the reasons are there which I've discussed in other parts. But doing akhika, it is sunnah to do on the seventh day. But if you cannot do and if you do later also, it is accepted. Do it as soon as possible. Again, it's not a fard. But if you do, it is preferable. Even if you want to do it now for your child, you can do it. Because it's a boy, you have to sort of two sheep or two goat of a similar kind because it's a boy who has a bruise or a small minor cut in the hand but naturally he should attend first to the heart attack because there are high chances he will die for the person who has a small cut he may be the person who has a bruise or a small minor cut in the hand but naturally he should attend first to the heart attack because there are high chances he will die for the person who has a small cut he may bleed it may cause little pain but the chance of him dying is very 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 negligible if it's a normal cut so similarly the best is doing both Dawa and Islam, but if your time is restricted and if two are in front of you, but natural only one sheep. So if it's a boy, if it's a son, 
two sheep of the same kind. If it's a daughter, if it's a female, then only one. And the reasons are there which I've discussed in other parts. But doing akhika, it is sunna to do on the seventh day. But if you cannot do and if you do later also it is accepted, do it as soon as possible. Again, it's not a fard, but if you do it is preferable. Even if you want to do it now for your child, you can do it because it's a boy, you have to slaughter two sheep or two goat of a similar kind because it's a boy. This is a question from Vaseem Mahmood Surjo, Dhaka, Bangladesh. How can a Muslim woman give dawah especially if her husband is almost a full-time guy. How can a woman do dawah if the husband is a full-time guy? It is compulsory that every Muslim, whether man or woman, should do dawah, whether the husband or wife or whether the spouse is a guy or not, it is compulsory. It is one of the requirement for any human being to go to Jannah, according to Surah Al-Asr, chapter number 103, was the moment to it is fard. Now, how can do? I would say that if a woman, her husband is a full-time guy, all the more easier to do for her to do dawah. Similarly, for a husband, if the woman is a full-time guy, for him to do dawah is much more easier. As Allah says in the Quran, in the same verse of fasting in Surah Baqarah, chapter 2, verse number 187, hunna That you are the garments and they are your garments. If both husband and wife are dies, it is excellent, it's much more easier. And, and while women are doing dawah, you should be careful that you should not break the rules of the Sharia. Because many a times when women do, do, do dawa, when I travel in the foreign western countries, I find that Muslim women are doing dawa, but they are not careful in maintaining the Sharia rules. And I also see that there's a Muslim woman wearing a hijab with a non-Muslim man in a closed cabin and discussing for us together about Islam. This is not accepted. Our beloved Prophet Muhammad said, said, if two, two Nahmeram are closed in a room, the third person is a devil. You have to maintain your hijab. You cannot look into a Nahmeram and uh, a man looking into a woman, a Nahmeram or a woman looking into a man, Nahmeram into the eyes and then for concentration and, and doing dawah fast together. You have to lower your gaze, you glance, it's okay. You cannot look into, a, your, into the eyes of a Nahmeram and speak for minutes and hours together. So you have to maintain this hijab. While giving to dawa one to one, it is preferable a man does to a man and a woman does to a woman. Only if a speciality is required, a woman cannot give the answers. And if the man and if the woman goes to a man for seeking answers, they should be you should you should see to it that there is a mahram. Like if like in our organization, Islamic Research Foundation, when a lady's question couldn't be answered by the lady's wing or my wife, and if appointment was required, my wife be with me or the lady's husband was there or the lady's father was there we maintain the hijab we don't look into the eyes we lower the gaze and speak it's possible but the best is man to man and woman to woman when it is one to one otherwise while writing books of course a man writes a book everyone reads no problem woman writes a book everyone reads no problem at all while giving lecture it is preferable a man gives a lecture there's no problem being a mixed gathering but if a woman is giving a lecture it is preferable that the audience should only be females so that she can maintain a hijab and she can maintain sharia. Regarding how can a woman do dawah, especially if the husband is a full-time dai, the best example is my wife, mashallah, even I would call her almost a full-time dai. I'm a full-time dai and my wife is also almost a full-time dai and I selected marrying my wife was because she was a dai and it's much more easier. Because even if you are a dai, you cannot say I am a dai, that's why I will not give time to my family. A beloved prophet said that the best amongst the believers is the one who is best to his family, especially the wife. Now if you are a full-time dai and you are busy, you know, the chances of you giving time is less. So if your wife is a dai, then what do you do? You give time to and discuss the dai, you are doing two in one, when dai You are doing the work of spreading the message of Allah, at the same time giving time to your wife. So, if, you are, if your wife wasn't a dai, maybe I would have spent half an hour with my wife in a day, besides the basic thing. But if she's a dai, I can spend more hours. And today I spend few hours every day discussing about dawah issues, discussing how can we promote Islam. So it's a Venn diagram doing dawah, as well as, as well as giving time to your wife. And when I got married, people told me that 
Ah, now that you're married, your time for dawa will become less. And I was worried. But because I married a daya, I started giving previous has to give before marriage maybe eight, nine hours a day. When I married, I started giving 12 hours. When I had children, we opened the school and gave time for school also, started giving about 16 hours a day. Alhamdulillah. It's a Venn diagram. How can women do dawa by various ways? They can, one of the ways is if they're good with the pen, they can write articles on the social media, they can write books, the literature can be spread, it can be read by non-Muslims, male and female, no problem. She can give lectures, especially exclusively to non-Muslims, exclusively to the ladies. And my wife used to give several lectures in, in India when we shifted to Malaysia. She used to give twice a week lectures and a lot of women used to come. It's now, because of lockdown, she started getting, you know, I'm feeling uneasy, you know. And now the month of Ramadan has come and there's no lecture, etc. So she started giving online. Never before has she given online. She doesn't have any audio of her lectures. Not that it's haram because voice doesn't come in the aura. But she wanted to be more careful. So for all these years, more than 25 years that she has done dawa, we have restricted any video recording, we have restricted audio recording. But now the situation was such that we are going to be locked down for two months and not doing now for two months, she could not. And she asked me, I said, no problem. All the scholars agree that voice of a woman doesn't come in aura. So she started giving online on webinar. Then I told her, why webinar? Go on the Facebook. So now when she comes on the Facebook, there's only an audio live lecture with PowerPoint presentation. She's not seen in the webinar or on the Facebook, but a PowerPoint. There's a PowerPoint which keeps on changing depending upon what she's speaking. So she's not seen because that is preferable because if you have a lady and the close up is there, there may be nam haram, there may be gents coming, it may break the hijab. So I'm not in favor of women coming on videos and it's a high chance the hijab can be broken. So she is doing on audio. Uh, if they're coming in naqab, then no problem. But I prefer an audio with a PowerPoint. And she has started. First, it was initially only a webinar, and there are a few hundred people coming. Now, last time, just last Sunday, she went on the Facebook, and more than 1,200 people saw her. Not saw her, sorry, heard her, and saw the PowerPoint presentation. Inshallah, when time rose, the audience would become bigger, the reach would be much more, inshallah. So, dawa can be done in various ways, but preferably, the woman should do dawah to the woman and take care of the woman problems because a woman can take care of the woman problem much more like asking questions on on on, on the on, on the thing of islam about fasting about the women issue a woman will be much more comfortable to ask a woman so in these cases of course and if she is the wife of a die all the more reason easier they'll understand each other better and many a time when we go, I travel a lot. I've given lectures in more than 40 countries of the world. And my wife has accompanied many times and she has given lectures in more than 20 countries of the world. And my children maybe more than 10 countries of the world. When we go many a time as a family, when I accept an invitation, they even call my children and my wife. So we go to a conference or exclusive lecture organized for me, series of lecture. I and my son speak to the gent. My, my son starts, gives the talk for half an hour, 45 minutes. Then I give a talk for about one hour, 15 minutes, one and a half hour, followed by question and answer session. Simultaneously, not at the same time, but the same day, maybe in the morning, my lecture is in the evening, at a different time. There's a separate, exclusive gathering of women. Like when we went to Indonesia, there were thousands of women, 5,000, 3,000, 2,000, and it was exclusively lady gathering. And my, and my daughter spoke first, then my wife spoke. And it was a 11-day lecture tour. After the lecture tour got over, we extended for two days and we had only family time. So it's a Venn diagram. We are serving Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for his commandments, doing dawa with the children, with the family. So the full family, the dai, it is nothing better than that that you can pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So I request that all the brothers and sisters see to it that if you can make dawah as your full-time profession, it's the best profession. Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Fusilat, chapter number 41, verse number 33, Allah says, وَمَنْ أَحْسَنُ قَالَ مِمَّنْ ضَوِي لَلَّهِ وَأَمِلُ صَالِحَوْنَ قَالَ لَا إِنَّ نِمْلِ الْمُسْلِمِينَ Who is better in speech than one who invites to the way of thy Lord? Works righteousness, says that I'm a Muslim. The best profession according to the glorious Quran, according to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, is a da'i.
So if everyone in the family is a die, nothing like it. If you cannot be a full-time die, at least be a part-time die. Don't be a spare-time die, but at least be a part-time die. We have from Hafizul Yasmin, Ahmed Hassan, Rayan, Bilaluddin, Bilal love you for the sake of Allah from Bangladesh, Nath Arju, we have Shaheen Ahmed, Asma Hussain Sadia, Mehfudul Islam, Sharmin Parveen, Ariful Islam, Dr. Zoheb Jat, Alex Midora, Yunari Yun, Muhammad Furkan Molla, Prince Wani, Assalamu Alaikum, Wa Alaikum Assalam, Wa Rahmatullah Barakatuh, Farid Ahmad, Malik Wurul, Muhammad Alamgir Kabir, I wish all of you Wa Alaikum Assalam. We will take the next question. I am Abdi Nasir, Muhammad from Kenya. I would like to know if one's fast is nullified, if one sees sperms on the tip of one's private part without ejaculating it voluntary or by force. Thank you. The question poses that if a person sees semen on his private part without forcefully doing it or ejaculating, is the fast nullified? He's talking about nocturnal emission when you sleep and and or it's called as a wet dream. Nocturnal emission is a more scientific word. Wet dream. If you have a wet dream and there is ejaculation of sperm without doing forcefully or intentionally, your fast is not broken. Your fast is not broken. You can get up, have a bath, do guzzle, and you can offer your salah. The fast is not broken in wet dream or nocturnal emission. Next question. A smile from Nairobi, Kenya. If a person takes food in his or her mouth unintentionally, but do not follow it, does it break the fast? Even if a person takes food intentionally in his mouth and does not follow it, the fast will not break. Let me give you a very good example. When we do wudu, we are taking water intentionally into our mouth, but we are not following it. We are gargling. And we're spitting it out. Does your fast break? And the answer is no. So if your fast doesn't break when you take food or water intentionally, similarly, if you take food intentionally also, you should not unnecessarily. But if you take and you spit out, it doesn't break. For example, if a woman is cooking in the kitchen and she wants to know whether the salt is correct or not, she can easily take and put it in the tongue because the taste buds on the tongue. You don't have to swallow the food. So if you taste it, and spit it out, it doesn't break. Some people take very little, you know, as a precaution. Good, no problem. But even if you take a lot and you put it in the mouth and you spit it out, just like water when you take for voodoo, it doesn't break. If you take even a lot of food, put it in the mouth and spit it out, it will not break. You should not unnecessarily do it. But if you are cooking food, take a little bit, taste it, you will come to know because the taste buds are in the tongue. It is not in your throat. So after tasting, you can spit it out, your fast is not broken, and it is permissible. But let me answer something extra. If someone takes food or water unintentionally and follows it, he forgets his fasting, goes to the fridge, pours water in a glass, drinks it, or he doesn't remember his fasting, he takes a sandwich and eats it, does the fast break. Our beloved Prophet Muhammad said, just mentioned Sahih Bukhari, volume number 3, hadith number 1933, that if a person unintentionally has food or water, let him continue keeping his fast till the end. And let him consider the food or the water he ate or drank, it is from Allah. That means if by mistake, unintentionally, you have food or water, you drink water, your fast doesn't break because it is unintentionally, and you think that it is from Allah, a blessing from Allah. But you cannot do it purposely, okay, I'm, I'm unintentionally having, you cannot have unintentionally, knowingly that you're fasting. So it should be purely out of unintention. And if you have, even in that condition, your fast doesn't break. 
There's a question posed on the Facebook by Abdul Rahman. Assalamu alaikum, brother. Suppose a Muslim doctor does while treating a COVID-19 patient dies. Uh, suppose a Muslim doctor dies. You know, many a time O becomes I, so it says does. But I realize even I, when I type, I want to type on, it becomes in. I want to drop in, it becomes O. So if suppose a Muslim doctor dies while treating a COVID-19 patient, does he get the reward of a martyr? And I quoted the hadith earlier in my first session as well as the second session that our beloved Prophet Muhammad said, it's a hadith uh, of uh, uh, Sahih Bukhari, uh, volume number 7, hadith number 5734, that, that a plague is sent by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as a punishment to the believers, uh, to the unbelievers, to whoever he wants, but as for the believers, the plague is a blessing. And if a believer sin, with sincere faith, if he stays in the place where plague is there and he believes that nothing will befall him except what Allah has ordained for him, then he will get the sawab of a martyr. And Ibn Hajar has said this, there are three categories of people here, that if a person who dies in the plague, he yet gets the sawab. If a person gets infected by plague but does not die, yet he gets a sawab of a martyr. And if a person doesn't get infected, yet he believes and has faith in Allah, yet he gets a sawab of a martyr. If he dies in another hadith, he's called as a martyr. But let me differentiate between a plague and COVID-19, coronavirus disease 2019. Plague is an epidemic. So for plague, you get the sawab of a martyr. But for every, ep for every epidemic, you will not get the sawab of a martyr. A plague is an epidemic due to bacteria. It is bacterial. COVID-19 is viral. It's an epidemic, but it's not bacterial. And plus there is another hadith of the Prophet Muhammad that where the Prophet said that the plague will never enter Medina. And another hadith says that the plague and the Dajjal will not enter Makkah. So the plague cannot enter Medina, cannot enter Madi Makkah. And we know today that the government is taking precaution Makkah, Medina. So why should they take precaution of, of COVID-19? Do you think Hadith? No, Hadith is Sahih. But COVID-19 is not a plague. So COVID-19 is an epidemic, but it's not a plague. So the Hadith says, if you die of plague, you are a martyr. If you die in a place where plague is there, even if you don't die, as long as you have sincere faith, you have faith, in, you have faith in Allah, nothing will happen except what Allah wills, then you get the sawab of a martyr, irrespective if you die or you don't die. But COVID-19 is not a plague, so please do not mistake in yourself that every epidemic is a plague. So if a patient dies of COVID-19 or a doctor dies while treating the patient, because he's treating a patient, he's trying to save a human life, Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Maida, chapter number 5, verse number 32, if you save one human being, it's as though you have saved the whole of humanity. So he'll get the reward for saving a human being or saving the whole of humanity. But he will not be called as a martyr. He will not get the sawab of a martyr. The next question is from sister by the name of Maryam. She's a revert. She's from Birmingham, UK. Salam from a new Muslim who was a Christian before. My children are six and nine years now. Sometimes they ask to fast, but I don't know if they are ready yet. I don't know if I'm ready to let them stay without food for the whole day. Please advise me. Thank you. Fasting is for only for an adult Muslim who is sane, who is healthy, who is not traveling. But it is not fard for a minor. But if a minor does it, it is preferable, they get trained. As similarly for praying salah, it's only fard for a Muslim who is an adult, not for a minor. But there's a hadith of a beloved Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, hadith which says that encourage your children to pray at the age of seven. And at the age of nine, if they do not pray, you can even use force. 
दो फर्द बिकम वेन दे बिकम एडल्ट फॉर अ मैन मे बी थर्टीन फोर्टीन ईयर्स फॉर अ वुमेन डिपेंडिंग वेन शी बिकम मेच्योर एट द एज ऑफ फोर्टीन और थर्टीन और ट्वेल्व बट नॉट एट द एज ऑफ नाइन सो द प्रॉफिट सेज एनकरेज दम इनकरेज दम एट द एज ऑफ सेवन एंड फोर्स दम एट द एज ऑफ नाइन आई वुड से द सेम एज कैन बी यूज फॉर द for the children here because fasting is a different thing but surely encourage them at a much younger age before they reach adult so that they get trained as early as possible i remember that the first time i fasted my age was something maybe close to 3 years and i kept the full ramadan when I, when i was in the second standard at the age of 7 my children fasted much more before me my son maybe at the age, age of 3 and he kept the full ramadan maybe at the age of 6 my daughter maybe she fasted the first time at the age of 2 and she kept the full ramadan maybe at the age of 4 or 5 so encouraging them is very good even if a child fasts and breaks in between there is no sin because they're not fard not that they have to compensate after ramadan it's a voluntary fast if you break you don't have to compensate it so you have to encourage them you can give them gifts okay if you fast i will give you some gift i will give you a toy i'll I'll get something, some good food for you, or get for you ice cream or chocolates. Good, encourage them and see to it that they fast the full month as early as possible, depending upon each individual. Not that because I could keep the full fast at the month of seven, nor my son could keep the at, at the age of seven. I could keep the full Ramadan. I could fast my son at the age of six and my daughter at the age of three or four. Every child cannot do it. So depending upon the capacity of your child, try it out. If they do not complete, so no problem. Oh, mashallah, you at least kept half. No problem. Next time we'll keep three fourth because it's not a fad. Encourage them. Many of the parents are afraid. Oh, my son will get sick. No one worry. Nothing is going to happen. You're not going to force them. Okay, don't do it. Encourage them. And believe me, it becomes part. And in in our school, mashallah, people from senior age to first standard used to many of them used to fast the full Ramadan, and all of them at least a few days. Alhamdulillah. and uh, the next question is from hasan pathan from kashmir sir how can we contribute financially for your organization is it legal to contribute from india a similar question was posed by qq mrs noor from dubai assalam alaikum kindly help how can i donate to peace tv i tried doing it from its website but failed twice the basic question is that how can they contribute to the organization the islamic research foundation international uk or can contribute to peace tv and one of the ways is you can go to our website and once you go to the website of peace tv the account number is given and you can contribute and i'm aware that when you transfer especially after 9 11 it has become more difficult to contribute to islamic organization and especially if it's outside your country it become more difficult so when people try it they are not successful and that's for the trying to you know prevent all the dawa activities you know those who don't want islam to spread if you can go to the website it's legal to contribute to the organization you can contribute even to peace tv the thing is there the account is there but those people who really are really wanting to help and you know somehow the other they get in touch with me you know and you know that because of the restrictions that are there from the various and we as a policy we always believe that we follow the rule of the country in india whatever we accepted was officially in in our trust account if we accept in uk we accept in the official trust account we believe in following the rules and regulation of the country so that we do not break the law of the country so that we can do dawa freely but in spite of this following the rules you know the enemies of islam are after us they are trying to see that the muslim organization don't get the funding they are putting pressure on the bank they are putting pressure on the organization so in this case but naturally a businessman who is really rich he knows the situation because he's a rich businessman he's a millionaire or a multi millionaire he's a billionaire he knows the difficulty because he's doing business so in this case is the businessman who really wants to help a dai who really wants to help me they get in touch with me and very easy people know where i am and once they get in touch with me they find out which is a very legal way to contribute without causing problem to the enemies of islam to contribute in big amounts and many people call me for lunch and for dinner and for meal 
and for every meal they give huge amount and big amounts alhamdulillah so those who really want to contribute they come and meet me when i was in bombay they used to come to bombay when i am in dubai they used to come to dubai when i was in saudi they come to saudi when i am in malaysia they come to meet me in malaysia they come and meet and we see a amicable way which is legal without getting into problems and yet they want to hide their identity which is good no problem. so what we realize that those really people big people who want to support any activity whether it be dai whether it be me whether it be pst whether it be other they are because they are in the field they know how to get in touch they get in touch and they support they can get in touch with my friend they can get in touch with me it's very easy in the age of science and technology today the whole world is a global village but for those people who are not so well versed and maybe an average common muslim wants to contribute you try it through the website through the channel official channel if you cannot my advice to you would be you can always contribute to a dawa organization in your country if you cannot contribute to pish tv you cannot contribute to islamic inter islamic research foundation international what do you do you search for the dawa organization in your country in your city google it do a little bit research and contribute to them you will get double sawab you will get sawab for helping them and getting sawab for helping us also and your sawab will not be reduced because i told you that so they will get sawab the people who you contribute to they will thank you they will do duas even i will do duas the main aim of us is to spread the message of allah subhanahu wa taala but see to it that the organization is authentic organization is a genuine organization that then take time to do research and contribute inshallah i will think the amount has reached me because our main purpose is to spread the message of islam if you are contributing to another dawa organization indirectly you are contributing to us and we will get the sawab hope that's the question <clears throat> Farid Ahmed Jaman Sheikh Sunni love you beloved Dr Zakir Naik Saheb I love you too Sadul Islam Sahidul Islam thank you Wajullah best for Dr Zakir Naik Hilal Ansari, I think, is it the same person I spoke to in the morning? Waalaikum Assalam. Hassan Habib, thanks. Junaid Halil, Salam Waalaikum, Waalaikum Salam. Arfan Hiddu, Abidul Hussain, Hafidul Yasmin, Asif Rayyan, Inayat Arju, Shaheen Muhammad, Mahfuzul Islam, Sharmin Parveen. and all the brothers and sisters wa alaikum salam i mean for all your duas we can take maybe one or two questions the time is short the next question is from rizwan from india Does swallowing one's own saliva break one's fast normally the way you live normally if you follow the saliva that is secreted from your saliva gland your fast does not break intentionally if you keep on accumulating a lot of saliva and then trying to gulp it down that's makru and that your fast but generally people are not aware that there are salivary there are salivary glands in the mouth which keeps on secreting saliva throughout the day on an average in a human being half to 1 and 1/2 liter 500 ml to 1500 ml of saliva is secreted every day on average we fast for 12 hours that means in every human being when who is fasting about 250 to 750 ml of saliva is secreted in half a day when you fast and you keep on gulping without knowing when you're sleeping you're secreting you're gulping and some people you know in my school i used to see this to spit i said what is spitting no i'm spitting so this to think you know gulping it's not possible